You must watch Garden Time. You must watch Garden Time. William, they're already watching Garden Time. Yes, but this is a new episode. Oh. Welcome to Garden Time, and you know, we don't think we have to <laughs> hypnotize you to watch the show, but we do want to thank you for tuning in every week. And on today's show, we'll be giving you some fall rose tips and also talking about a fall rose show. We're also going to take you to a garden which really gives back to the community. But coming up first, the Pepper Lady. Well, I am so excited to do a segment on peppers, and I am with Susan McCormick from Rose City Pepperheads, and this is an amazing urban farm. And you grow how many different kinds of peppers? We grow about 15 varieties. Amazing, amazing. They're beautiful plants. They're really gorgeous. And so you picked a bounty here, and there's some I've never heard of before, so kind of go through them. Okay, the first ones we grow uh, is the prized red jalapeno, or we actually grow red fresnos. Okay. And that's what everybody uses in sriracha. Ah. But we actually make our holiday jalapeno and our raging red jalapeno with those. Ah. And they have about 5,000 Scoville units. Okay. Kind of pretty mild. Oh, okay, that's considered mild, okay. All right, and then these yellow ones are gorgeous. Those are our Scotch bonnets, and they have about 80,000 Scoville whoa, units. Whoa, whoa, So whoa. they're a little bit hotter. I think in their, their range is about that seems really high but they're very fruity and very approachable okay. so they're really good in salsas uh, they're really good um, in our scotch bonnet pepper jelly All which right. is what we make or our jack uh, our jack's blackberry has um, the scotch bonnets and it's finished with jack daniels oh that sounds it's lovely very lovely <laughs> and then what's this green one that's a green jalapeno and um, most jalapenos are around uh, 2500 to 5000 but our green jalapenos run about eight they're pretty hot oh okay so we put those in our hoppin' jalapeno and our Hawaiian jalapeno. All right. And then these ones that are kind of elongated down front These there. are called a shishito. And these are a Japanese frying pepper. Most people know padrones mm -hmm. um, because they're kind of like the roulette pepper. One in ten is hot, but we think one in four is hot. Okay. <laughs> so these are actually a Japanese version, and they're not hot at all. So oh, they're okay. about a zero on the Scoville units. Ah. And um, you just put them in a pan, put a little olive oil on them, blister them up a little bit, and finish them with a little salt. They're just delicious. Ah, and I know I've noticed that you have recipes on your Instagram and your Facebook page, so that's really something to remember. We do, lots of great lovely, recipes. Lovely, lovely. And then I have know these, so. That Poblanos, Poblanos, Pasillas, yeah. yeah. Most people see them in the Mexican restaurants, yeah, and yummy. we make chili rellanos yes, oh, out of them. And then another pretty one, another orange one. This is our ghost pepper. Ooh. This is um, a, what we make our sneaky ghost with, and we've probably won most of our awards with the sneaky ghost. Cool. Um, it ranges somewhere around 600,000 to a million oh my units. Gosh. <laughs> so it's pretty warm. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we love to make um, our IPA shrimp with it, with a little bit of IPA beer, and the sneaky ghost, little garlic, and soak it. And, Put them on the grill. Oh my gosh, that sounds delicious. And now another big one here. This is just an Anaheim pepper. Oh, they're it's gorgeous. very model, uh, very mild. A lot of people would normally see them as a hatch chili, mm -hmm. um, but unless you grow them in Hatch, New Mexico, you can't call them <laughs> <Okay>. that. <laughs> so. And then this little tiny one. Those are our habaneros that oh, okay. haven't turned orange yet. Okay. They're, it's pretty early for habaneros, and uh, they go in almost all of our jellies. Our Marionberry Blast. Um, our huckleberry, our strawberry. Uh, we uh, see that at about half a million Scoville units, Whoa. six to a million. And this is the granddaddy, so which is this? This is our Carolina Reaper. Oh. And we actually make those into our um, hottest pepper jelly, and that's our Grim Reaper. Uh, and what's and that Scoville's? It's about a million and a half. Wow. And now we have to explain what Scoville's are. It's like, no, nah, I got an education today, so explain what that is. A Scoville unit is a rating that's based on the amount of capsaicin that's in each pepper. So that's so the like, heat. Yes, and like a bell pepper 
pepper would be zero. Okay. And that just moves up on the scale to the hottest one so far, which is the Carolina Reaper. Holy cow. And a million five, until they find another one. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And you know, we have to talk about growing peppers. We have people that write into us or we see them somewhere and it's like, I'm not successful. How can I grow them? So can you give us a couple tips? I think the first thing to remember is that don't water them until they really wanted to be watered. We walk the fields, we really look at them, and when you start seeing those lower um, leaf plants start to droop a little bit, mm -hmm. then you want to water them. Ah. I think most people tend to overwater their pepper plants. They love the sun and they love the heat. Ah. So that'll just produce more. Okay, and then you were saying about the variation of the heat, and so a warmer summer, the, that the temperature of the flavor goes up. Yes, the warmer the summer, the hotter the peppers are going to be. Wow, if, wow. And if, another thing that's really nice to know that if you water your peppers right before you pick them, they're going to have a, low, a lower Scoville rating. Oh, that is so interesting. It kind of takes the heat back just a little bit. Well, people know you for your jams and jelly, so tell us three that you just love to recommend. Well, our raspberry habanero is the one we just won the grand championship in New Mexico oh, well, at the Scoville Awards. And the next would be our holiday jalapeno coming up because that's what we use our red fresnos in. Okay. And then I would have to say probably our sneaky ghost and that has one of our other hottest ones in it. So, uh, so those are for the people that just love that, that yes. thrill. Yes. And then how can we find you? Because we want to get these really as soon as possible. Uh, first place is Beaverton Farmer's Market. Oh, great. It's one of the longest farmer's markets I've been at. Uh, and then we can also find us at uh, local grocery stores and boutiques, but you can find us online uh, for shopping and you can find all of our recipes on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, well, thank you so much for oh, all the information. Welcome. This has been thank so you. much fun to meet Susan and hear <laughs> all about these crazy peppers. It's like I've learned so much and you are great for t t you. telling us all about the tips so we can grow some maybe at our house too. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. U-Haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. A destination farm and garden market featuring the very best each season has to offer. Smith Berry Barn offers seasonal farm fresh fruits and vegetables and specialty herbs and perennials. Visit the historic barn for distinctive gifts, gourmet foods, and homemade milkshakes. Right now we have fresh picked or pick your own berries ready in our fields. Here's what we have to offer this week. Centrally located off of Shoals Ferry Road between Sherwood and Hillsboro. Smith Berry Barn, growing good taste from the ground up. Why do the finest builders shop at Standard TV and Appliance? I, as a builder, have been represented by Standard TV and Appliance for over 20 years. Standard TV and Appliance is that core vendor that makes a difference in my company. Standard TV and Appliance is a type of partner that any builder would be proud to have. Standard can make your dream kitchen a reality, setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and Appliance. Well now, while it may be September, I am standing in a beautiful rose garden. I'm here with uh, Rich Bear and Rich. So today we're going to talk about a few things, but let's start off with, with, with some, some concepts of what we should do with roses going into fall and winter. I think the most important thing that I tell all gardeners is enjoy them to the very fullest that you can. And that means you don't do anything special to them. You let them grow and bloom until the weather finally gets cold enough that they stop growing. They do not go dormant, so there's nothing you can do in the fall to help them. All you can do is enjoy them as much as you can. 
And you know, I, I have to say, Rich, that while living here since 1996, every time I've had roses, they have often bloomed into December and sometimes on really mild winters, even January. So they really aren't just going dead dormant, are they? No, and uh, when you talk about having them, I don't think I've ever had January roses because I sort of give up on them on December. But a lot of people cut their roses back in the fall and they will take roses like this and cut them down because they think they should. And I go, if there's buds and we right. have a couple sunny days in, in November, December, they'll bloom and they go in the house. Because you can still, you can cut them at any time if you want to. At but any time. Why cut all, all the blooms that are still going to be coming? That's what I say. Okay. Enjoy them absolutely the, as much you can. And if there's buds, you might have blooms and you can get wintertime. My garden's big enough that I, something's blooming all the way through December. Right, right. Most people don't have the luxury of having a thousand roses to pick from. And so then I have to wonder though, is what, what are your thoughts on other things like fertilization and all of that stuff? Is there, is there a concern of timing for that? I hear a lot of things that uh, if we encourage them to grow um, by like fertilizing late in the year, the environment determines whether the plant is going to grow or not grow and not anything you do. You can fertilize them any month of the year and it isn't going to suddenly kick them into growth unless, right. unless of course, there's been absolutely zero fertility in the ground and suddenly there is some. But that doesn't happen in our soils here. There's always enough fertility to grow lots of things. I said, look around the environment. The trees have been growing here for hundreds of years and nobody fertilizes them. And your roses, whereas you can encourage them to grow a little bit more and more vigorously by fertilizing them, they will do just fine with or without. So then when you, when you prune this amazing garden, what time of year do you generally tend to start cutting them back a little bit? Well, I don't do the fall pruning at all for the reasons I just told you. Um, and I, it's big enough, it takes enough time that I usually start in January. And anytime there's a nice afternoon, I'll come out and do 25 or 30 of them, which is, everybody would be calling the spring pruning where I cut them back hard. And I try to get it done by the end of March. Uh, sometimes the weather allows me to get it done by the end of March, and sometimes it doesn't. Because you know? it's so, not like you have a, a crew of you know, 30 people out here helping you. <laughs> no. Well, you know, okay, so speaking of roses and blooms and all of that good stuff, tell me a little bit about this, this wonderful event that's uh, happening quite soon. Well, we are having our fall show at uh, the Lloyd Center. It'll be two days. It's open to the public. Anybody that has a rose growing in their garden and they think they have a pretty bloom, we, we, we welcome you to come. There's no charge. We will help you if you've never done it before. The hours are restricted to when they can do that, which will be between 7.30, 6.30 actually, and 9.30, which is Saturday. Uh, the uh, entries close at 9.30 and the show is judged then from 9.30 to noon and it's open. The mall's open all the time, but we officially open the show about noon on that day, saying that all the judging has happened and all the winners are where they congregate on the winner's table, so. And we try to get on the average, oh, around 1,000 to 1,300 vases of roses wow. at, at that show. Um, and they're really, that just proves how beautiful the whole rose thing could be even going into the fall as well. The fall, if normally you get a little bit cooling, cooler at this time of the year, and a little bit cooler makes the colors brighter. Wonderful. And the, the blooms often get a little bit larger too because they don't get cooked quite by, so by fast the by the sun. <laughs> Today they're being cooked. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're, you know, we love roses. Of course we do at Garden Time. And, you know, we always think there's so many great ways and lessons we can learn about how to take care of roses. So for more information, not only on this wonderful event, but on roses themselves, you can go to gardentime.tv. We'll click over to the website, gather all that information, cut your blooming rose and take it into this wonderful event. Rich, thank you so much, my friend. Well, thank you for being here today and we hope you have a good rest of the day. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. They had to take the car, they had to get it open with the jaws of life, take me out on a backboard, took me to a Trauma One Center. I absolutely feel like the Subaru saved my life. Well, we, we trust Capital. We trust our salesperson here, Jackie. Jackie's great. I believe that she really cares about us. She teaches me about the Subaru. 
our way, way on, on the, the parkway. parkway. Build a beautiful home inside and out at French Prairie Perennials. Inside, we have just the right creative elements to complete your decor. We offer an oasis of unusual, nature-inspired garden and home gifts and accessories. Outside, choose from our wide selection of unique dwarf conifers and sparkling companion plants. French Prairie Perennials, located between Woodburn and Wilsonville. Take exit 278 to Aurora and French Prairie Perennials. Every year, trees fall or break, causing property damage, power outages, and injury. Now is the time for Bartlett Tree Experts and Collier Arbor Care to get your trees ready for the extreme conditions ahead. Our free consultation will help to spot the signs of potentially hazardous trees. We can help address problems before they occur. Whether it's trees or shrubs, we can help you get a healthy and beautiful garden. Collier Arbor Care and Bartlett Tree Experts, providing environmentally safe tree care since 1907. To bring the extraordinary colors of fall to your landscape, you need to come to a place that offers more than the ordinary. At Sagawa Nursery, we love fall. From brilliant yellows to vibrant reds, we have one of the Northwest's largest selections of Japanese maples. At Sagawa Nursery, we also have a colorful selection of hardy plants, so your home can be as beautiful as the season. Come visit us and see how we can help you make your season extraordinary. Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. I'm at Little Prince of Oregon today with their head grower, Mike Hicks. And Mike, you know, we know Little Prince of Oregon for all the wonderful plants that we show at, little, at uh, Garden Time and at all the garden centers, but you're really going to tell us about how we get to all those beautiful plants. So here I have some plugs, and so you start little baby plants like that. And mm -hmm. so these are so clean. I mean, the foliage is beautiful. I don't see any kind of insects flying around. So how do you get to that? Well, it's all part of our IPM program, which is Integrated Pest Management. And it basically, it really starts with cultural practices. So we start with as clean as we possibly can be. We start with sanitation, uh, just keeping everything as clean as we can to give the plants the best start that we can start with. And you really have some really skilled staff. Everybody's trained to water correctly, make sure that um, there's no insects. And so what if you see like one or two bad plants? Do you just like leave them or do you dump them right away? Well, first off, we really need to identify what that pest is because just because you see an insect doesn't necessarily mean ah, that it's bad. Sure. It could be good. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, if we find one and we've identified it and we say, you know what, that's an aphid. We don't want that aphid mm -hmm. around in here. And we, there's only one or two containers there. We'll just cull it out and throw it in the trash. Mm -hmm. And so I see that um, in a lot of different places have those little yellow cards. So is that kind of like an indicator? Do you kind of see exactly what's going on? Yeah, that's one of the techniques that we use out here. The yellow sticky cards will attract some of your flying pests, but it's more than that. It really comes down to our training of our staff. So everybody that has an eye on the plant out here is looking for that. They're saying, hey, because I only have two eyes, I can only <laughs> see so many, so many plants sure, out here. Sure. So the more eyes we have on everything, the better off we're going to be to find that problem early on and spot that problem early on. So if you see something, do you spray it right away or are there other tools in your toolbox there? Yeah, no. Spraying in an IPM program is really the last resort. Ah. So the first thing is we talked about sanitation, cleanliness, then you go to identifying it, then you go to removal if you can, and then at that point we start adding beneficial insects into our system. Ah, and is that what's in that canister? Yes, this is one of them. This is Delosia. It's for uh, thrips, uh, fungus snatch, short flies. It's just one of them. We use numerous, probably about 10 different ones. So say you see some insects on a mature plant, is that when you start putting the beneficials? No, actually we start a lot earlier than that. Okay. So we're in our plug house right now. Okay. And what we do is we do a lot of preventative beneficial insect applications. And that starts when they're young like okay. this in our propagation houses, in our plug ranges like this. We release almost exclusively beneficial insects in here. Wow. And that is our control methods for here. And the theory is, is that as we're potting these plugs into this finished product, we're taking our beneficial insect populations that we've established on our plugs, planting them up into our finished containers, and then sending them out to our 80 different plug or greenhouses throughout the nursery. 
And the hope is, is that we're going to start establishing our beneficial insect populations in our finished ranges out there so that we still have the good control that we get inside these plug ranges and our propagation houses continues on into the finished product. Wow, and I see so many different finished products. I mean, I see succulents, I see your containers for the fall, I see these ferns, house plants. You have so many different kinds of plants and really these beneficial insects are everywhere. Yeah, we hope that we've really established them in a lot of different products and all of the products that we send out. So Mike, if I take one of these to my garden, will I get some beneficials? Well, it definitely could. Huh? Well, you know, take a lead from the experts at Little Prince. So in your own garden, make sure that you know the pests that you are going to be treating for and spray as a last resort. And really, take some Little Prince home to your garden. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery. A passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Is your garden in need of refreshment? Hi, I'm Sarah, and there are plenty of things in bloom at Portland Nursery. Come check out our beautiful fall color to perk up your garden. At Portland Nursery, we consider fall the second season, and the gardening opportunities are endless. Establish next year's trees, replace lettuce and greens, or get a jump on onions and garlic. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. On 50th and Stark, and 90th and Division, or at PortlandNursery.com. Fall is a time to think of planting and planning. Planting new plants now will help them get a jump start on next year. Black Gold All Purpose can help your plants get ready for winter and next spring. Formulated with a blend of natural and organic nutrients, it contains everything your plants and spring bulbs need for a happy and healthy start. Look for Black Gold All-Purpose at your local garden center or nursery. Black Gold, all the riches of the earth. Fall in the Northwest is... The best time of year to plant, with warmer soils and cooler evenings. A time to spend with family and friends. Fall is a time to celebrate. To decorate. And to enjoy the colors that are only found here in our area. Fall is a time to come to Garland Nursery. And let us show you all that fall can be. Garland Nursery, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. Well, I cannot tell you all how happy I am to be here with Beth Radford Watts, a dear friend of mine. And mm -hmm. Beth, first of all, tell us where we're at. We are standing in the Providence Milwaukee Hospital Employee Garden of Giving, a garden that we grow for members of our community who need healthy food. Well, and you know, it was several years ago now when we came here, when it was first starting, and I have to say, this place has expanded. Tell uh, me about that. <laughs> it has. Uh, this was an empty lot that had an old house, and we donated that to the fire department, and we um, decided that we had all these people who really needed healthy food, and it's very expensive uh, to buy healthy food. So we were like, hey, we should put a garden on that lot, and we started off with eight beds and now we have 48 beds Wow! and uh, in the beginning each department kind of sponsored a bed and they would come out and take care of it and as the season grew on it was like okay we should collaborate our effort a little bit more and then uh, miraculously wood just started showing up here like piles of wood and uh, like the overlaying laying over there and so we just kept building more beds and so 48 beds and we do about a ton of food every year um, it's all uh, volunteers by nurses and doctors and housekeepers and phlebotomists and wow. administrators and bosses and cooks and everybody come out here. But you even have you even have help with Boy Scouts, is that? Oh yes, the Boy Scouts. There's there's a great group that helps us out. Um, we have had 10 Eagle Scout projects in this garden, started with the colorful shed behind us. That was project number one. And the last project number 10 are the little small greenhouses um, that are behind us by Eric Wolf, um, Boy Scout Troop 606. <laughs> and uh, they just finished that up a couple weeks ago. So they definitely help us um, to make this garden a great place to, to visit and to grow food. And really, that, that's one of the things that I, I love about uh, the, the hospitals that have you know healing gardens in them now and, and vegetable gardens and all of this different nature is it really an action with the community so tell me I'm assuming that a lot of food is grown here now 
Where does it all go? What, what do you do with it? So we have, um, there's a, a hillside manor across the street from our hospital that has 600 residents and we bring food to them once or twice a month. And we have a pantry that's actually on the hosp hospital property um, also that is a food bank. And we serve them two to three times a week. And um, other people have come to us and expressed needs, or if we hear of somebody in need, we will make them food baskets. And and you even do things like you'll, you, you, have, you were telling me a story about how you, you, know, you can even train people on how to cook that don't know how or how low income cooking yes. works. Oh, yes, that. we have an exciting program. Um, we have a teaching kitchen here. So we have a, a program within the Providence system. If you go to your physician and you say, uh, they, they will ask you some questions actually, you know, did you go to bed hungry tonight? Or did you not have dinner so that your children could have dinner? You know, are you not paying bills or whatever, or gas because you're struggling with food? Um, the, the physician will write a prescription out for our teaching kitchen and yeah. you can come down and you can have classes there learn how to cook economical meals and then you get to go shopping in the back food pantry and take home food for your family wow. and then we, we have a little teaching garden down there that I often teach people um, how to grow some food in a small space. I, I have an apartment here and grow a ton of things in that small space. And there's some examples of what to uh, grow in small spaces and perhaps things like tires that you don't want to use right. for garden produce. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So Beth, clearly this is a wonderful garden, but what if people want to get involved? How do they do that? Well, we have a Facebook page that I do most of my communications through um, to the public, and that is the Providence Employee Garden of Giving on Facebook. We post um, our work parties and our harvest days and sometimes some recipes um, and things that you should be doing in the garden at that time of year, and definitely you can contact us through that. Wonderful. Well, you know, at Garden Time, we love to include all aspects of, of gardening, and this is one of the the better ones that we can all get involved with to help and assist in. So for more information, as always, we will invite you to go to gardentime.tv to gather that information for your own. Thank you so much, my dear sweet Thank friend. Thank you, good to see you again. <laughs>Thank you for watching Garden Time today. William, are you still trying to hypnotize us all? No, no, I'm just kind of hypnotized myself by <laughs> how fast this half hour show goes by. No, that's so true. So if you want to see the whole show again or a particular segment, you can always go to gardentime.tv. And we had so much fun today. Why don't we do this all again next week, right here on Garden Time. One thousand one hundred twelve. One thousand one hundred thirteen. William, what are you counting? I'm counting all of our wonderful friends on Facebook. And we invite everyone to go to Facebook and like us and follow us. All you have to do is go to GardenTime.tv and hit the Facebook icon, which is in the top right hand corner. It's the best place to get the most updated information on Garden Time. So all you have to do is click us and like us. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.